Nation in Conversation proudly brought to you by Afgri, Monsanto, Nedbank, Senbes, Engine, Grain SA and John Deere. Conversation broadcasting from Nampo Harvest Day in Boerteville. I am Suzanne Paxton and today's topic is women in agriculture. My guest today is Gloria Serobe from Whipholt. Welcome Gloria. Uh, we also have Liesel Foster from Dr. L.A. Foster Boerderijen. Welcome. And Lindy Stribble from Produce Marketing Association. Welcome. Thank you. Now we're going to talk about women in agriculture but i want to start with a little story because we all uh, are now women in business or professional ladies in in working conditions and offices uh, and we work with the public and i for instance at some stage went to Stellenbosch, and I, people came and they introduced themselves to me and they introduced themselves ladies specifically and they were saying uh, well good afternoon i am Mrs. Dr. Van Tonder, <laughs> or I am Mrs. Professor Van Tonder. So she was using, they were using their husband's titles to introduce themselves. And it was quite sad to me that uh, they felt the need to do that and not to be the woman that they are. Um, and I don't know if you've experienced it. Gloria, maybe, maybe we should start at that. Have you ever experienced women doing that? No, 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 I heard it from you, actually. I haven't, uh, but it's not a bad thing. It's your husband, so I may as well cl claim the title as well. <laughs> <laughs> I haven't experienced it at all. Anybody else ever experienced that? Mm, no. <laughs> Once I have experienced that in, in a sense that uh, women tend to lose their own identity um, if they feel um, they are not if, if, if there's somebody superior to them. And um, it's not wrong to have social structures where um, you find a head of the household or something like that, and if you're comfortable with it. But in business and in many social structures, especially in now time and age, um, women have nothing to stand back for. Um, they, they don't have to be subordinates. They don't have to take an, their husband or partner's title to um, determine a right for themselves. So I have heard of that, and um, you, you, you do find in social structures women um, putting themselves back um, where it's not necessary. They have full right to put themselves and their own identity forward and be themselves. Gloria, I see that you're agreeing with a lot of the statements uh, that she made now about what a woman should be. Um, and maybe we should just mention, Whiphold is a black woman-owned investment company in the mining and agricultural sector. Um, and it's not something that you hear often about. It's, it's a woman black-owned company. Well, the, um, when 1993, Whiphold is 23 years old now. And, and when we started it, it was when we recognized that uh, men are comfortable to talk to each other, uh, both black and white, about business. And somehow they forgot about us. And so we, we decided to form Whiphold uh, then in 1993. And we, we took into account the fact that both black and white women are actually uh, not involved in business. So we actually uh, did uh, an, IPO, an IPO to all women uh, to take up uh, the shareholding uh, a public process. And we could do that because it was 1993, we offered it and people were not quite aware then that they have constitutional right to object to exclusion. You won't get away so with that now. We did I it think. under the radar screen, but it was taken up. And in this prospectus, 
Uh, we actually wanted people to sign an affidavit that they are women as they are buying these shares. And so 18,000 women uh, responded and took up the shares. And that's how WePold was formed uh, 23 years ago. So it is a woman-owned uh, company. But the business is, we've always had to fight this confusion about, do we do woman things then? Uh, if we say you are going to, people expect us to be baking scones and and we love scones, but yeah, I mean, do, <laughs> do you bake scones? <laughs> Don't know how to bake, but so we we then had to deal with this discord about we're a woman-owned company, but we will do business like any other person, and so the sectors we are in uh, are financial services. Uh, we have a, a cement plant in Limpopo. Uh, we are in uh, sasol mining. And one of those areas we felt we need to go into three, four years ago was agriculture. We just felt challenged by that sector because it's, a, it's not quite friendly to women. And Why uh, do you say that? It's a, I think it's historical, to be honest. It's a macho kind of, of business, but nobody is getting directors and all that kind of thing. So I'm not sure why women should not be seen as natural players uh, in that sector, especially that we are very big on food security side. As women, as mothers, we are the ones who decide who eats what at home. So by then, this side of production, this side of processing, and all of that, we are not in that uh, uh, line of it. And therefore, we thought that uh, agriculture, we must take it head on. But specifically, we decided to do something that the sector doesn't do. There is a rural land, it's communal land. It has no security of tenure. People don't have title deeds there. And we decided to go that route and, and use that land and, and take it from being communal land to being a, a commercial, commercial farms. And so in Eastern Cape, we are the second biggest maize farmer at this point, 2,000 hectares of that. And um, we're quite, quite excited about it because we, we've, we've demystified all the challenges of people not having title deeds and no security of tenure, which is why the investors are not going there. But as we hold, backed by Old Mutual and NetBank, we have actually shown the way that actually you can do it. And it must be done. Arab land is on that side of the country. Uh, the fact that people don't have security of tenure, which is something government must fix. But in fixing it, I don't think we should wait for that to be fixed. Things can be done, and we've structured that such that it works. In the end, uh, these communities own like a hectare each. And so these 2,000 hectares, you can almost estimate 2,000 families. And that land is next to each other, so you can block it into 100 hectares, into 300 hectares, it's not little gardens, and, and do what gets to be uh, meaningfully done. Mm. But the, the interesting thing about it is when we did that, then we're now looking for the beneficiaries of this land, who are the owners? Because we have to pay uh, uh, rental to them, we have to give them their dividends, so you are doing we had to have a tidy database about who do we pay to, including their bank accounts. So to our pleasant surprise, then over 50% of these people were women. Big smile. Mm -hmm. uh, but it, it was by default. Some of them are widows. And, and, and some of them became the beneficiaries of reference because the husbands are working. Uh, either in Cape Town or Debian, they are the ones that are there. And, um, but, so that was over 50% uh, uh, women. But if I can then tell the story, Suzanne. Yes, let's, let's, let's talk about the woman um, being the breadwinner at home while the husband is a breadwinner far away. You played a major role in supporting the men or the women of, or the wives of the men that were part of the Marikana strike. Um, and if, if you remember correctly, it was a major tragedy uh, in the mm -hmm. country. Um, and you played a major role in helping those women help their husbands. 
But what happened there, and it happened because where we are is a labor sending area to, to the mining uh, houses. Uh, it's in Tendane, it's in Willow Vale, Aitujua, uh, that side of, of, of the world. It's a labor sending area, so most men are actually working in the mines. And these women are the heads of households here. And in this case, uh, what happened then that the, the Marikana strike by nature was very long and, and, uh, and people couldn't go home and they were not getting paid and they were sitting here and it became quite a stressful situation even for them. But because the women there are now farmers and they are getting rental income, they are getting their dividends, they ended up being the ones who are sending pocket money to their husbands in, 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 in Rustenburg, which then maybe comes to another point that the, the challenge of South Africa is too big for this perpetual exclusion of women because in a situation like that, something was solved by women in their own rural areas because there is land sitting there idle and doing nothing. And investors are waiting for men, I don't know. But in a case like that, there was food in the house. The children were fed, plus the husband was fed, until that whole thing could be solved. And the wives were doing it for themselves. Now, um, Liesl, I want to speak to you now about what you do. Um, and you work with big animals. Most people living in the cities you know, don't come close to, to big animals. You've got a very successful uh, farming unit there in Zastron in the Free State. Tell us about it. This is, and I'm a commercial beef cattle farmer in the Zastron area. Um, our farm is commercial, got a commercial Drakensberger herd as well as a stud. I um, do the work that the men do. I physically vaccinate, I dehorn the calves, we brand the cattle. So um, I do all the work that the men do on the farm. Now, if we've listened to what Laurie have said of, of a sort of traditional, uh, the farm will go to the son uh, in the family. How did you end up with a farm, a cattle farm? Um, I'm the youngest of four daughters, uh, the fourth generation on the farm. And it has always been very important for me to, for the legacy to carry on. Your forefathers worked very hard on the farm and I think it must be, uh, it's a, an achievement to hand something down to the next generation and it's a sustainable business to the next generation. And um, it just so happened that I went to go and study agriculture and uh, I married, got married and my husband isn't involved in agriculture but I just ended up farming, doing, doing the farming on the farm. What is the challenges? I would say the main challenge at the moment is the political uncertainty that we're having in South Africa at the moment. Um, the questions about land reform, how it should be done, um, it leaves a lot of questions out there. Um, is agriculture still a safe sector in which one can invest? If you do invest, is your capital safe? Um, I would say the crime in the rural areas is also a big problem, as well as the, the unemployment and the poverty, which um, escalates the crime. The farm murders are also worrisome. Um, I would say that's also uh, quite a, a big challenge. Uh, that, my, I would say, is my, my, the main challenges. Yeah, because see. you're on, on the border there, South African border, I think, with Lesotho, if I'm not mistaken. That's quite a high crime area. Yeah, the Zastron border is on the uh, former Transkei as well as yes. the Lesotho border. Um, due to that, I just find that your networking with your neighbours mm -hmm. and the people around you is very, very important, as well as my neighbours in the former Transkei. It's important to have good relationships with everybody around you and as well as your um, farm workers and everybody um, that works for you. It sort of, I would say in a certain way, sort of forms a security net to fall back to if there are problems. And I don't say, I, I wouldn't say it would prevent problems, but it's an important step in trying to uh, curb farm attacks. It's, it's just networking with everybody. Do you experience, uh, you know, a difference uh, between the farmers if you, for instance, walk into a place um, and you're a woman and uh, it's a gathering of farmers, uh, do, do the men treat you differently? Um, people in our area don't. They used to me. I've become a fixture at the meetings and uh, functions that they have. But in certain areas it has happened where you stand and you, uh, you get introduced and men will walk up to you and they'll greet everybody around you. 
or they're not sure if they should shake your hand or give you a hug or kiss you, <laughs> or they sometimes ignore you. So that, that does happen, I, I would say. How it does do you happen. react when they... No, I greet them. I, I, I make a point of greeting them and putting out my hand and shaking their hand. Sorry, I see you laughing. You have experiences as well, right? I just kiss them. I think it's okay. <laughs> <laughs> Now, Lindy, um, you're also uh, heading a very, very big organisation. Um, tell us about that. Suzanne, I think my story um, it goes broad. I've always been in the, in the service of agriculture, um, but my story actually started, my link with agriculture started in um, uh, growing up on a farm, of course, and having the farm lifestyle as a kid, and, and it, it's in your blood if you grew up that way. And then here in, it was standard nine, what's it now, grade 11, um, when you have to make your career changes, I had no idea what I want to do. So you go into these um, tests that you do so that they can guide you what to do. And I'll never forget, the lady said to my parents, if only she was a boy, we would have recommended that she goes farming. And that was the reality. And, and not even thinking about it at the time, I ended up studying food science. Um, and here by my third year, realized, but this is not what I want to do. I want to be in the agriculture space. And, and I um, changed my course to agricultural economics. So um, from there on, always been in the agricultural economics environment. And um, then uh, from working from the University of the Free State, then moved to the agricultural business chamber, where also as an economist, but serving the agriculture sector. Very um, exciting environment, and only about a year and a half ago, I moved from the agri Agbiz, as it's known now, I moved from Agbiz to the Produce Marketing Association, or PMA, as we call it. Um, I never saw myself different from my colleagues. Um, it is a men's world. I studied in men's environment. I think Liesl will agree with me. Your, the classes were, we were a handful, one or two, um, of a class of 20 uh, boys, we were one or two girls. And um, I never saw myself different from them in any aspect. And that still reflects today. We um, will be in platforms, um, whether it's challenging or exciting platforms, uh, we're all equal in that, in that game. And I think it's, um, it, it lies in how I see it and how I do it and, and go about it. But still, it is an environment um, that it's sometimes uh, surprising for people to, to um, rather be uh, outside of the agriculture spheres. Um, in social structures, people say, oh, you're in the agriculture sector. Um, they don't quite understand it. The general perception um, out there, especially in the city, um, they don't understand that you work for the agriculture sector and you're a lady. So you do get that. Um, I've, I've never really had um, negative experiences in that regard. Um, perhaps it's just my perception, but um, not, I'm a blind eye for it, perhaps. <laughs> um, but yes, the environment that I work in now, in the Produce Marketing Association, it's a global organization. And one of the um, four main pillars of our value uh, that we uh, present for uh, members is um, under the umbrella of the Center for Growing Talent by PMA. And it's <clears throat> very exciting for me because one of the important focuses for them is to empower women and to provide women leadership. So we've got a couple of conferences. We also host uh, um, locally here for PMA in South Africa. We've hosted last year a women's breakfast and this year in August planning an afternoon evening event, which we call the, uh, we call the Women Fresh Perspective um, event. So yes, it's, in, it's nice for me now to be in an environment that recognizes that we need to do something. We need to empower women. We need to provide a platform to build on their leadership um, in the agriculture, and in our case, the fresh produce industry. But why only one for women? Don't we want to be equal to men and compete in all the same spheres and <clears throat> be in the same place? Why only one for women? It's a very good question. There is. Um, other platforms like executive leadership programs and emerging leadership programs, you can get various of it. It's not linked to organizations. You get some at various universities, locally, internationally, etc. Um, but this is a focus for the, for the women to, to get to a point 
um, to, to get a network amongst each other, to learn from each other. We face the same challenges in different aspects, the challenges that Lisa um, experienced, the challenges that Gloria experienced. We can learn from each other. Um, and that will build in our leadership as women in business, in agriculture, in, in your household. Um, so it's, it's important to provide that platform. Um, Gloria mentioned something that I associated a lot with. She said men easily, and that's uh, one of the founding re or reasons for founding the organization, was men easily networked um, with each other. And I think it's a historical thing. It's just men been leaders in business over many decades, and um, it, they automatically fall into that position, and they network easily. They'll go for a beer, go for a golf, and nowadays mountain biking. Women didn't have any of that. Um, there weren't platforms like that to provide networking possibilities. And that's why uh, we're filling a gap in that regard. And um, we also open it up to, um, like for instance, the, the upcoming event, the first sessions would be for the women only, to pre provide a safeguard um, for women to interact, be frank, say how they feel, how they experience things and learn from each other. But then the evening function, we open it up for men. It's a women's event. And it's fascinating how the uptake is. A, typically, a situation would be a CEO, a, a, a male, which will bring, uh, it will take up a table at the event with ladies from his organization. And afterwards, talking to some of those men, they found it as an eye-opener for first time to be in a discussion environment just with the ladies in his organization. Never had that opportunity to learn things that they experience and things that they see different. And in some cases, even got some points that was very valuable for themselves in the company or personally. Now, I want to go back to something that you mentioned um, earlier. And Gloria, I want to speak to you first about it. Um, you mentioned that you went for these tests. And they said, if only you were a boy. Do you think we will ever get away from that sort of legacy that the son in the family will inherit the farm or be the farmer? Um, if, we, if we don't talk about it, <laughs> we won't get out of it because it comes from uh, generations and it's a worldwide thing also. Uh, it's not a, a South African thing. But um, I think it's important that we, we, we put it on the table all the time that it might just be that your legacy is safer with your girls. And, 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 and judge children, characterize them according to who is best to do that, as opposed to this anointment of, uh, of, uh, of men. And sometimes some of the sons, you see, they are seriously harassed by this thing. Um, they just don't want to be there, but it's a bed now on their shoulders and their, shoulder, and, and their shoulders. So I think, and that is one. But the second one is that uh, we, fathers, husbands, cannot perpetuate uh, this uh, poverty around their princesses. At the same time, they love them to death. And to other, on the other hand, they cannot trust them with their assets. There's something, there's a bit of a discord there because you cannot match this love with the anointance, the inheritance that actually goes to this uh, issue. On the matter of land specifically, that is an asset that is emotional. So who said this daughter is not emotional about this piece of land? So I think we have to encourage uh, uh, our partners, husbands and everybody to actually look at this matter. It is not complicated. And one more thing is that uh, we, even as, uh, as we hold, we're not feminists. All of us have children. And by the way, mine is a boy, so I can't fight with men to such an extent. But the, the point here is that we are fighting for coexistence with men and not the replacement. We want to be with them. We want to be married to them. We want to have children. All of those things are get done. What we do not want is this structured uh, demotivation of girls, that they are only supposed to do A, B, C, uh, when in fact, like all children, they must say, so, 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 so look at her. She says she's married. She's keeping her, her father's uh, legacy properly. And 
ordinarily it does not happen that they are one of the few uh, in, that, in that sense. And I think they can be made to be examples to a lot of, uh, of others that actually it can be done and it can be sustainable and it doesn't change the, doesn't change. Uh, but it's a worldwide uh, issue. It's not just South Africa. Liesl, why did you, you, you mentioned you, you touched on it. Why did you go into farming? Why did you study farming? Probably, I think the most important thing is the love of the land. Um, it, it, it was the main reason, love of the animals. And I would be lying <laughs> if I'm saying that you, I wanted the legacy to carry on. It was also a very important um, determination for going to go and study agriculture. It would have been sad to see the farming come to an abrupt standstill because there's no, there's no sun to be able to run the farm. It was, it was a very important consideration for me. Now, let's move on to, to women empowerment. All three of you are in different sectors of business and sort of parts of agriculture. Um, what should we do to empower women um, to think for themselves and, and reach out and grab the opportunities that's presented to them? Please. I would say it's the way you raise your, your daughters. Um, you must raise your kids with the idea that they can do anything possible. I think that's where it starts. It's, it's too late to start high school or in tertiary education. It's the way you raise your kids. Um, they must know that they are capable of doing anything they set their heart on. Absolutely, I can't agree more. Um, I, I had the privilege of growing up in a house where we were three daughters. And it's not the typical setup of, let's say, on a scenario of a Sunday when you come back from church, sissy must go help uh, make salad and Bruti must go help make the fire. I w didn't grow up that way. We, we made the fire and we assisted on the farm as any other kid and any other boy would do. And that's something I would want to um, provide for my kids as well. And I, like I say, I can't agree more with what Liesl is saying. I have the privilege of having a little boy and a little girl. And um, the way I see it is I want to promote them to know that it doesn't matter what your gender is. You, you're capable of anything. You can play with anything. My little girl can play with the cars. My little boy can play with her dolls. And it's, it's fine like that. And, and that's, the, that's the basis of in future. They will understand they've got equal rights. And I don't think we should underestimate the change of the generations. Um, there is um, nowadays the, the young generation, the, the millennials, um, I love them to bits. I think they're fascinating and they're crazy. And, and I wish I could say I fall into that age group, but I don't. But um, in my mind, um, I, I think I do. <laughs> so if you look at the changes of the generations, um, before the baby boomers, there were, a, a, and the baby boomers were the generation that stood up for their rights, including from animal rights to women rights. And, but before them, we need to understand, and that's not many years ago, we're talking 50 odd years ago, um, was a generation that they call the silent generation. And they were, whether in a tribal setup or whether in, in a Western um, social setup, there was always the male leadership and you were subordinate to it. And there were always structures in the working place. Um, whether men or uh, women, you, had, you wouldn't have the freedom of speech and standing up for your rights, etc. Many of those facets still come through. Uh, we still have fathers and um, perhaps even mothers that teach their kids that. And that's what we need to change. Um, we need to move out of it. And um, the millennials are going to surprise us. They. They are not bound to rules. They've got access to information. Little girls got equal access to information and inspiration as little boys do. So it will sort itself out. Um, and, and I think there's a role that we can play to empower women by, by providing platforms to build their networks and um, assist them and ensure them, inspire them. Mm. And if it's artificial, it's going to fail. Um, it shouldn't be enforcing. Uh, women, you have to employ a certain amount of women in it because then it's, it's not based on merit and, um, and the enthusiasm of that particular person. It's going to fail then. Gloria? There's a lot of uh, audience for this topic. I think the first one I want to speak to strongly is the women themselves. 
um, we have to understand that we are coming into business <coughs> uninvited. You don't have friends there. You are almost invading a space where you don't have company. And I always say invasion is invasion. There's a war now. Go there knowing that you are going to a war zone and then be in war and not pretend like you're in a picnic. And, and so some of the luxuries of uh, lifestyle issues about, I'll take off for four years and go and have children. You don't need four years to have children. Uh, it's only one day to give birth. The rest of the days are not, you know, struggling, nothing. So we are actually need to talk to ourselves too about, we are either serious about it or we are not. And let's take the challenge and deal with it. So that is number one. Because unfortunately, we have to be super successful to be taken seriously. On the established uh, business, people who are still struggling with this matter of, of women, it is important to stress to them again that it is very inefficient for them to continue excluding women, when in fact the challenges are plenty and for all the sectors. And they have to be, and it's, it's bad management uh, to exclude women uh, from, from, from their business. Then you've got the third category, which is our sons now. At an early stage, we have got to make them believe that it is OK to work with women. You're not being a CC or something like that. We have to bring them up like that to make it normal for them because they will be CEOs and managers uh, very soon. They must come home with that uh, kind of, uh, of attitude. But there are some cases which are lost cases, of course, and some of the social uh, things of the old are still entrenched uh, in our DNA. When you go to the rural areas, you've got to work hard to dig women out of their shell uh, to speak up because in there, they are not expected to, uh, to do that. So it is, but it can be done. And the few who are there have got to be the right, those pioneers where people can have them as reference points about success. And specifically for WePol, it has been important for us to be successful on those areas where we are not expected to be successful. And like any businessman, they are now forced to speak to Wipold because it is about business. And they've stopped talking about us being women. And they're talking about Wipold as a business. When, when did that change? Um, when did that change? Um, maybe, I would say halfway through the 23 years. Because the first, the first uh, period was quite uh, very hard. I, I have to give this example. We went to this mining house. No, 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 we went to a mining in Daba in Cape Town. And now the mining sector is like the agriculture sector. It's all uh, the football club. <laughs> and, and so a simple question there of, Mr. So-and-so, and I would mention this CEO of one of big mining houses. What is it that we need to do to get women to be acceptable in your industry? What is it that maybe we are not doing? And comfortable, this man said to me, and she didn't, he didn't even call me by name. She said, lady, you know when they say lady? There's something silly there, lady? In mining, you need to have balls. I said, oopsie. <laughs> what was your answer? And, um, and so uh, the answer from me was, we've got different parts of the bodies. I've got breasts, you've got balls, <laughs> all of that. <laughs> but can we come back to the mining? Sector, <laughs> how this thing works, because that was a question. And so you get put down like that. And, 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 and our response is difficult to be always wide awake to insults. 
mm. because you, that's not normal. But uh, the, the, the point is that it is entrenched, unfortunately, in most of the established business people, this thing of women here and men here. And uh, there's a lot more work. So halfway through, we pulled because we were showing success in places where now people were forced to partner with us and all of that kind of thing. And so that changed. What also changed is that uh, we stopped being associated with soft women issues. And so it became normal that we are going to be strong in financial services, we're asset managers like everybody else, we're in net bank and all mutual. We are all these things that uh, other people are doing and we started getting to be associated with straightforward, hardcore business. But at the beginning, it was quite a nightmare. I could actually ask you the same uh, question, because uh, dealing with, with farmers, uh, men in general, if you walk into a conversation, there's always some sort of joke that could be below the belt. How do you handle that? And, and when did people start seeing you as the person that actually knows how to farm these animals, the cattle? I must say there are some awkward um, things that do happen. You just smile and laugh it off and make as if you didn't hear or see anything. Um, you turn a blind eye to it. But with me, I would say, un probably unfortunately, but um, I think where my gender was, start, start, stopped becoming a factor was when I got my PhD. I had to get a PhD to stop people referring, you know, looking at me. Because when you say to them, listen, yeah, I'm, I'm a farmer, then they'll ask, but, uh, but the first question, where, what does your husband do? Where is your husband? And when I got my PhD, that question, sort of people stopped asking me that question. Mm -hmm. Because somebody from the bank now recently came to me and said, oh, but I thought you were in partnership with your husband. I said, no, I'm not in partnership with my husband. Mm -hmm. But unfortunately, as I say, I had to get a PhD for me to, for my gender not to be a, 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 a so he issue now became, anymore. He became Mr. Dr. Yeah. Foster. Yeah. <laughs> right. Uh, so, so but, but, you know, it, it was a difficult, uh, even after that, to sort of say, listen, no, no more. Um, respect me as a person, the woman of this farm. Look, um, my uh, role in, in agriculture is a bit different to the other people, I, uh, the panel members here. Yeah, I grew up in a farming community. I went and studied agriculture, so I've always been surrounded by men. Um, it has never been, I've never been, I can't say I've, ever, I've been treated differently. I've never come, I'm not like, like Gloria, that, that I was actually treated differently. I've never um, experienced that. So, um, yeah, I... Different age groups of farmers. There's definitely a different. Um, I find that the older men are more accepting, um, more inviting. They'll come up to you when you go to on a farmer's day. It's definitely the older men that will come up to you and start a conversation with you. Um, but people my age and younger, um, they won't come up to you. I think it's probably because the older people are more comfortable in their skin or maybe you, because your presence there um, exposes insecurities within them. I think that's probably what it is. And older people are more uh, secure in who they are. So how do you handle the situation in the boardroom? See, in a boardroom, in a difficult position or in a, in a normal day, if, um, if you want to be good for business as a woman, you can't be a little girl. You know, you need to stand up. You need to, nobody's going to do it for you. You need to stand up and do it yourself. You need to be self-confident. You need to understand your topic, not, not as a woman speaking into an environment, but as a person speaking into that environment. Um, and that, that will all depend on, on the value of what you contribute with a boardroom, on this panel, on outside socializing. It all depends on you. So that, that's how I, my advice, perhaps, that I would send out, because that's how I see it in my life, um, how to build it. And once you um, put yourself down, 
then you're going to experience it and, and you're going to walk in as a little girl in a farmer's day and you're going to experience it for yourself as men not allowing you into the environment. And it's your own perspective. Um, if you embrace, like what Liesl's saying, embrace the, the people are more accepting, etc., and you pick up your hand, you not being a little girl, and you um, go in with confidence, they're going to respect you. Um, and, and you will be treated equally. Uh, I, I really think um, the statistics uh, speaks for itself. Um, there was a survey done in the US where they said um, th uh, uh, companies with women in leadership uh, do 30% better return on investment. That's a, a broad survey and, and something that the, our Center of Growing Talent by PMA sometimes promote to say women are good for business. And um, I, I will stand by that. Um, and, I, and I think they are good for business. There's also a role that women play if you consider um, your uh, um, emotional part. We are more emotional. There's nowadays more emotional men as well. But um, there's, there's the more emotional part of a woman that we shouldn't underestimate in the agriculture sector. Um, there's the emotional uh, interaction that the consumer nowadays wants with our products. They want to have a theater of food. It's not just pap fleece and uh, but, uh, uh, rice fleece and articles anymore, you know? They, they want to experience it and they want to understand. And the agriculture sector delivers that product to the consumer, who's largely the one buying it is largely women. And they want that emotional experience. So if the sector wants to position themselves to better deliver to the um, to the consumer, we need more women with that uh, emotional understanding of what the um, consumer wants. It, right through, if you, if you talk of um, input providers, the seed manufacturers example, need to understand if, if the consumer no more wants a pepper this size, they want a small picante pepper, the seed uh, company needs to understand that. And uh, a woman in that decision making can make a very big contribution because they are a consumer, they are perhaps moms, they are um, part of the emotional understanding or the understanding of the emotional need of the consumer. There's a huge role that they can play and that's something that we promote also. Gloria, I see you agree. No, I agree, I agree with that. Um, especially in the, in the boardrooms, there's some hiccup in the boardrooms because there's just subtle things that you always have to deal with, being ignored or something, uh, or they pretend like they didn't hear you or whatever. But the boardroom, the job of the chairman is to listen to you. You can harass that chairman until he gives you the airtime. That's your job. But what if they then say, um, oh, she's emotional again? <laughs> Is that you get? No, 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 no. You, you harass him nicely. You, <laughs> <laughs> you scream at him, but you just kind of like, I have to say something on this matter. And please do accept that. I, I will say it. So, and I think in the boardrooms, the, this is over time. Things are getting better, things are changing, but it started bad that in the first place, the expectation of you being in that boardroom is not quite what you want to be. You, you are not here to make it look nice. You're here to do what this guy also wants to do with his business. And, and that discord comes in and, and, and all. But I think it's fair, as she's right about the older, people are much more comfortable with themselves that they kind of embrace you with time. And I think our generation is the one that still needs to be worked on, but really maybe it's not an issue anymore. You just do what you have to do. Speaking of emotion and, you know, special kind of skills women have, we are born with it. Uh, I heard through the grapevine here <laughs> that women make better uh, farmers when it comes to animals. Do you agree? No, I agree. Um, 
in the farming community, we, we speak about stockmanship. <laughs> a lot of people who farm with animals don't have stockmanship. But I think farmers, due to our nurturing nature, um, due to our caring nature, we are better stock, stockmen. Um, and we uh, achieve better results due to it. We probably, I think also it's important when you're working with animals to have empathy. And I think we, we um, women have probably have more empathy than what men do. So um, I would say women definitely do wow. make better, better stockmen. Out of interest, stockmanship is what? It's that, that sixth sense, that gut, that gut feeling. It's, it's something that you cannot teach somebody. You either have it or you don't have it. And it's, it's that gut feeling that something's not right. I can't my put, put my finger on it, but, but something's not right. Or um, you pick up on problems on the farm much sooner than what your male counterparts wow. do. That intuition. Um, my mom always said a little voice yeah. in her head that's yeah. telling her something's yeah. wrong. Uh, I don't know, have you experienced it where, where your intuition, you were listening and you're saying, OK, let's go for it? Uh, yeah, I, I've always struggled with this one about whether we're different or not different, but maybe we, we are, but I've struggled to <laughs> to claim that uh, as women we are better at the emotional thing. Intuition. But maybe we, yeah, it might be right because we will, when we discuss medical aid, we'll jump quickly, we'll understand the whole thing and we will do the right thing. So maybe there is an element of ours where we, we just mother everybody in the head <laughs> <laughs> and then maybe that's where that comes from have you experienced it, it actually this discussion makes me think of um i can't remember the english version Grootie Grootman, defend the caveman, caveman. Mm. um where uh, men are defined as the hunters where we where they draw it in a very humoristic way draw it back to um the prehistoric times of the role of men and women and women are the gatherers, you know. We, we gather the, the seeds and the, uh, um, and the things. So that, that's also reflective in the business world, in your decision making. We observe more. We, we take in more. Um, we need to multitask. We're known to multitask better than men. If that's true, that's an that's a open point. But we are gatherers. And um, men are the hunters in that humoristic way explained um, how the partnership between, and when you get to a decision-making position, like going back to the example of a boardroom, uh, the combination of women and men um, there is very valuable. Uh, you have the gatherers bringing in all the information. You have the men who can target down and say, this is what we should do. This is the de decision. Um, and it also doesn't mean the one has a particular role and the other one not. I just think the combination um, could be very valuable. Let's look at government. And the South African government uh, wants to empower women. If you look at legislation, at uh, the amount of uh, ministers that are women, they're making a point of, of trying to empower women. Um, Firstly, do you think enough's been done uh, by the government, and should we wait only for government? Government has done better than business, for sure. Um, over the 20 whatever years, there was a time, for example, the ambassadors of all the major economic countries <laughs> were women. Whether you looked at London or Germany or US, those kinds of. Now, mindful of the fact that the role of the ambassador now is that of the economic relations, it's no longer a ceremonial thing. They are expected to do strong economic relationships work. And so, once the South African government could trust women with those kinds of relationships, I thought that. It's a high-risk uh, thing which they are prepared to do. If you look at their uh, portfolios, uh, government portfolios, strong uh, uh, portfolios, health, foreign affairs, housing, you know, these hard places. 
and you find that they have their own women ministers there and all that kind of thing. But then there's another story, which then it comes back to, we must also be careful that when you see failures there, it's not a failure of a woman, it's a failure of a wrong appointment. And it's men and women, you name it. But I like the fact that they are balancing this thing. They are actually showing uh, the, the desire to do the right thing. I don't know in the middle if it is going there. But, and, do, and they do express it verbally that women must be empowered. Uh, it gets a champion from, 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 from the office. So I think the government is doing better in that sense. Business is struggling a bit. It's, it's kind of, but business will say, we need the pipeline. So I'm sympathetic to that too. So if we need a whole pile of CAs and we don't have them, we are not say business must wait for women CAs in the next 10 years. You are saying they must hire CAs. So there is a bit of a pipeline issue, there is a, a whatever, but you want to hear more of that noise from business on their own that we have to do the right thing. I got a bit of a different um, uh, experience when it comes to this. Um, I lecture part time and the students in my class, I'd say more than 50% are women. Um, I just think in the South Africa today, there are sufficient opportunities. There are a lot of opportunities out there. It's for you to, as an individual, to identify those opportunities and to empower yourself. Um, I wouldn't say because of women, the opportunities are less. Uh, I wouldn't say there are sufficient opportunities there. So yeah, I, I would say there is sufficient mm. empowerment, if I can put it that way. But one must be careful about the word of empowerment because I don't want to know that I've been given a job because I've been empowered. I want to be given a job because I know I am capable of doing that work. So um, that's also just important. Uh, as Laurie said, you must be capable to, to do that work. Oh, I totally agree. Um, and, and if you do it artificially, um, it's not just bad for that structure, whether it's a government or business, um, because that person will fail. Um, if it's done artificially, and um, and if it's if the person is not, if the woman is um, given a job because she's a woman, and not because she earns that job, she will fail. So and that's not just bad, like I say, for the for the business or, or the uh, government organisation. It's bad for that person as well. Um, and and if you set somebody up for failure, that's the worst thing you can do to somebody. Um, and so, but like Liesl saying, there's a lot of empowerment initiatives and it should be embraced and um, supported um, so that there's en enough women with the right um, uh, merit, uh, knowledge, etc., for the right jobs. It, it's always a complicated uh, question, this thing of uh, you don't want to be seen as a product of empowerment. In a funny way, I am keen for people to know I am a product of empowerment. The reason is that in the absence of this pressure, women would be nowhere. That is a fair point. Left to their own devices, men will carry on with themselves and, and not a, 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 a take this into account. So there's a bit of a push that had to be made to make it happen. The balancing act, though, is uh, who do you feel in this push? People must be equipped. But if a bank has a, a job to have 10 women CAs in their bank employees of 2,000, and they say, we do not have them. They will make them. They will create them. They will create the pipeline. They'll go to UCT. They will find something there to make it work. What I'm saying is that there is something about this empowerment which it must not be associated with inferiority. Mm -hmm. And secondly, we have to champion it as well and not say we came here out of merit. 
Yeah, merit we have. There's just something that I don't know how to call it, but there's a balance there that I think that we need to recognize that in the absence of that pressure, women will be nowhere. But then, next to that, it must be clear that you are not hiring women simply because they are women. You are hiring them, you are giving them the right equipment, the skills, and all of that kind of thing. And you don't have enough of them, create them. And so reroute root people. If the country demands uh, 10 women engineers, we will find them. And if they're not there, we will create them. It takes 10 years to do that. Let's have a plan, a 10-year plan to create proper engineers and not put somebody there who is not. So that's, there's a balancing act there for me that I do want us to say we are subjects of empowerment. I'm quite excited about that because, and it doesn't mean that I would not have been able to work or something like that, but there is something the child behind me must know that there is a pressure of that nature. And, but then they must be made to be fully equipped. Just to, to wrap up, um, if you have a message for women out there, maybe men as well, uh, what should they do to be successful in business, agriculture, in whatever they do? Um, to be successful anyway, <coughs> people love excellence, so it doesn't matter what you, you're doing. You've got to give much more uh, to this, to show excellence and, 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 be, and be that person who is a reference point for knowledge and hard work. And work ethic is very important for every one of us. All we are doing is to push people into the entry. Once you are in there, you've got to work very hard and make it work, even for those who champion you to go in there. <coughs> and, um, and, and just be mindful of the fact that it is still very far for us to say there is enough women uh, in the system. But so once we are in there, create space for more women uh, to go in there. Diesel? I would say um, to, in the commercial farming sector, it's very important to retain your identity as a woman. You're not competing with the men. Um, they are your colleagues. And um, I would say that's, that's the most important thing. Embrace your womanhood um, and be comfortable with it. Dindi? Ditto. <laughs> <laughs> no, absolutely. Um, uh, one thing I think this goes uh, beyond um, gender and, and, and it is that you should embrace every moment um, where you get involved in. Um, I've learned over the years the strangest, smallest, and sometimes um, irrelevant uh, things that we were involved in. Sometimes you find yourself in something and you think, oh, do I have to do this, you know? Um, even, especially when you're younger and young in the industry. But at the end of the day, you look back and that's the things that you've learned from. That's the things that they, when you get in a management position, for instance, that you apply, that you realize. So embrace every moment um, throughout, wherever you get exposure, embrace that and go full for everything. And it counts especially for women um, because we tend not to do it. We, we should stick up our, our, our hands where we get the opportunity. We should embrace the moment because then you will never, never have to see yourself as inferior. You can be confident in what you do and you don't have to, like Liesl say, you never have to compete. You just embrace who you are, embrace the moment, embrace yourself as a woman and be confident in the business world. And that is our panel this afternoon speaking about women in agriculture and in general. In, uh, South Africa, for that matter. Uh, it was uh, Lindy Strubel from the PMA. We spoke to uh, Gloria Serobe from Whipholt and also Liesl Foster from Dr. L.A. Foster Boudreau. Thank you so much. And uh, thank you for joining us. Remember to follow us on Twitter and visit the website to nationinconversation.co.za. I am Suzanne Paxton. Good day. We have a few minutes for questions. Um, so anybody that's got a question, raise your hands. There's a mic here. Yes. So there's a lady there at the back that'd like to speak to us. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. I've actually got four questions. So if I can just run through all of them. 
The panel mentioned barriers to entry in agriculture in their respective markets, one being access to funding. Can you share some of these barriers to entry and how you've overcome these? Number two, when we look at the evolution of women's role in agriculture, what more do you think can be done by the public and private sector that is in respect of agriculture? What structures, policies, or the pipeline of tenant, like you mentioned, for women to be successful in agriculture? What advice do you have for female <coughs> entrepreneurs considering to move into the agricultural safe, uh, space, example, agro-processing? Uh, that is also moving from grassroots farming to a successful and sustainable agricultural commercial farmer. And my last question, have you, how have you all embraced innovation and technology in your respective areas of your business? Thank you. Right, who would like to start? I see Gloria smiling again. <laughs> you like to start? No, she Maybe, start. Lindy? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Lindy? For my sins. Mm -hmm. I'm going to start with your last question because that's the most exciting question. Um, last year I had the wonderful experience of attending um, it's the Women's Fresh Perspective conference that we had in San Diego in the USA. And there was a lady that spoke about your personal branding and use of social media towards your so, uh, personal branding. Now, I'm, I'm not a very big participant in things like Facebook, etc. to be honest. But that lady taught us that you should use technology, whether it's... Um, the, your participation in social media or whether it's access to information. This is now on a personal point and it's not te te farm technology in this regard. Um, where you should use that to promote yourself. I was always thought I'm not a, a subject to the public, you know, and made that decision that yes, my private life is my private life. I'm not a subject to the public. But yet in the professional environment, you need to position yourself. Use the technology, use um, social media to tell people who you are and what you do. It's part of stating to them that you're confident in what you do. Um, so that's just a small way of a general technology that you can use to promote yourself and, um, and in business in general, um, to, to make better decisions and to influence decisions. She uh, also mentioned uh, in your first question, if I'm correct, the uh, uh, barriers to, to entry into business. And, and she mentioned that uh, all three of you had some sort of um, issue um, in your sectors. Everybody's looking at Liesl. Yes. <laughs> um, it's incredibly difficult to start a commercial or any farming business from scratch. It's, it's all I can tell you. It's very, very, very capital intensive. And if you don't come from a historic farming background, you're going to have major problems. Um, the, there is funding available, um, but business plans and things and partnerships with, with that are very, very important. And um, when it comes to technology, very interestingly, the cattle industry are very, very slow to embrace technology. It's not like um, the agro sciences and agronomy, um, but it's this due to, um, how can I put it, your physical constraints as a woman, that you're not as strong, you'd find that women tend to embrace technology more than what men do. Um, and especially in the stud breeding industry where I'm involved in, we, uh, technology is very, very important. Um, and with, with your question with funding, um, you spoke about funding. Um, I've just now recently applied for a loan, and um, the processes that I had to go through is exactly the same as my male counterparts. But as I say, if you do not come from a traditional farming background, it's, 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 it's a very uphill climb. Gloria? I guess there is nothing more um, that explains the question about the barriers and the access than if you look at Eastern Cape is a rural area, all of it. And so is Limpopo, and so is some parts of KZN. It is not by coincidence that uh, these places are called poor because they don't own the land. And so the starting point is the lack of access of, of collateral and land and all of that is the one that makes the banks not look at you for funding. It's a chicken and egg situation. 
And so there are two things for me, specifically on agriculture, is that one, that is why we're saying, can you just give the chance to women also to do this thing because they need access to this industry. And that access for most people start with having land in your hands. You use it as, a, as, a, as collateral and all that kind of thing. And um, so if you then take all of Eastern, can the poorest province in the country? That's because all of it, these people have no access to an asset. And no bank that's going to talk to them. No matter how well you speak and how good this uh, business plan looks like, banks are looking for security and you don't have it. And so I think if, uh, if one were to say government must fix this thing of the security of tenure of this communal land, it will change a whole lot of, of, uh, of whatever. And then we they still have the next challenge, which is that patriarchy is also strong there. The traditional leaders also give land only to boys, mind you. So we have to go to traditional leaders as you will give to women now. It's quite a hard topic, I must say. <laughs> so you have to, but the lever for the agricultural sector specifically, it can be anything but land. Even if you look at the agro processing and the rest of the value chain, the starting point is that the primary growth is the one that actually requires land and we don't have it, and therefore the lack of security, and therefore the lack of funding, and therefore the banks are not going to talk to you. So while we, while we can talk about these things as if they're just emotional things, but you are perpetuating poverty by not people giving people security of tenure or this prized asset called land. And, and you keep uh, impoverishing women in that sense, and, and, and yeah, and they stay in marriages that they should not stay in because it's their social security now. And I think somewhere we need to correct this thing because that poverty is structured. And we have to kill that structure of perpetuating that poverty around women or perpetuating that poverty around rural, which is also largely women. And that is how it looks like uh, our Right, there was one more question. Is that the, um, about, I think the third question about from substantial farming to commercial farming, how to help women and propel them uh, from substantial farming into uh, you know, commercial farming. Um, and, and Laura, you have worked, you're working on projects like that. For as long as the land is little, it's one hectare, it remains that. And so one would encourage that block them. Uh, so in Eastern Cape, we take 300 families and take 300 land. That becomes 300 hectares. It starts to become a, a commercial a kind of thing. Fun, yeah. And therefore, it starts to have decent conversations with the banks and so on. But if you go to a bank with your one hectare, you are immediately put as being a subsistence. So if possible, to group the land, uh, is, is, is a, moves you from subsistence to commercial. And then you then have the next step now is that the big uh, agriculture players have got to have a, a mindset of helping now uh, because the, the intellectual knowledge is with them, the skills are with them, the exposure is with them, and they can do a little bit to really people, I'm told people are doing all manner of things to help. Yeah, but this one of pushing from subsistence to commercial, uh, you need you need the, then you start needing them a lot to to help. Whether it's equipment or it's on the inputs or it's in the uh, land prep or all of that, and just the knowledge of how to do it. Uh, but it starts with consolidate the land amongst make yourselves a big group. If you only have one head, uh, put yourselves into many. You, for instance, ask Liesl to help you yes. with, with, with that, yeah. I just, we find the same tendency amongst the commercial farmers. Um, there are a lot of discussions at the moment now of starting um, a company and putting all the, prop, the, the uh, assets into the company um, to try and assist each other. But, uh, to, to, uh, it's about eco economy of scale. Yeah. 
So the commercial farmers are also actually busy starting with the, with the same um, concept that the Gloria is speaking about. Hmm. Another question was done here in the front. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, my name is Marion Shukminya, and I'm MD of Harvest Time Investments, which is a subsidiary of AFGRI. Um, it drives development initiatives for, for AFGRI. Uh, my question is to Mom, um, Gloria. Um, Mom Suru, um, you mentioned earlier on that, um, and I joined the conversation um, halfway through, so I hope my question hasn't been dealt with. Um, but you mentioned earlier on when the question was posed um, um, whether government and business are doing enough, and you said government is doing more than business, definitely. And if we look at the broader transformation spectrum, um, a lot of the well, a lot of the things that are done by business are. Um, driven not only by willingness, but also by the triple PE uh, legislation being there. Um, do you believe that maybe it's time for a separate um, legislation that drives um, different targets for business to meet in terms of uh, black females? And I'm not talking particularly on, if you look at the triple BE um, uh, legislation, it addresses a lot of the black female representation in terms of employment equity and maybe management control and a little bit on preferential procurement. But if you look at the other two elements, which is enterprise development and supplier development, which are particularly tailored to supporting uh, black business uh, to become viable, um, those ones, they don't have separate um, female um, representation targets. Uh, do you maybe believe that we need to beef up those, or do we need a separate legislation that addresses that and maybe get business to take this seriously and, and do a little bit more than what government does? Should I answer that? Yes, please. <laughs> um, the, the way I see it is, is that um, business is suffocated with too much regulation already. They are complaining about too much of that. So it, it would seem to me that the existing legislation put those layers in that enterprise development and uh, supplier uh, whatever, as opposed to have uh, another, another legislation. There's something about this legislation which they are talking about lack of certainty now. To, today there's legislation one and tomorrow there's legislation two and next week they don't know what the next is coming. So we need to stabilize around a lot of regulations and strengthen those elements where they are weak. Just make an amendment. That would be my, that would be my suggestion. Any more questions? There's a question at the back. Hear from the male voices. Thank you. My, my name is Pumede uh, Kaber. I'm chairing a panel on Friday on youth uh, and their views on on the future of agriculture. So join me on Friday. <laughs> Marketing um, yourself. But to the point um, of this discussion, I would like to know, simple, straightforward, what would you consider yourself successful and what's your measure of success? I want an answer from all three of you. <laughs> <laughs> let's, let's give you a brief and let's start with Cindy. <laughs> For a moment to think. Um, <laughs> Measure of success is always a personal thing. Um, for one person, it could be a position. For another person, it could be financial. For another person, it could be status. Um, personally, for me, it's a, a, it's a combination of things that is important to me. It is to um, be able to have a balance in my life, um, religiously, physically, um, all of this is it's a balance of your life, and if, if I can measure, uh, if, if I can achieve that, um, that's where I feel I'm successful. So, but you can break it down, and I think that's where you're le leading towards. You can break it down. In my world, am I a successful mother? Am I a successful businessman? Uh, uh, businessman, business lady? Um, am I a successful? Um, a stakeholder person, am I engaging successfully with the industry, which is a large part of my role? I think yes. I think I am, um, and that's the part where I'm preaching, saying being confident in what you do. So you should also acknowledge yourself uh, without being arrogant, 
Um, it's not always easy to achieve it, and you do have your challenges, but amidst the situation, yes, I think I have achieved it um, and uh, still achieving, and success is never, never a, a, a thing that's, um, it's just one level. You always need to push it forward. So um, yes, on where I am, where I've, what I've said for myself, but I'm, I'm, I'm setting new measurements as I go on on every facet of my life, and there I'm not, I'm not there yet. Still need to achieve that. <coughs> Lisa? Well, I think you first have to ask, what is your measure of success? Um, I would say mine would be to be happy. Am I happy what I'm doing? Do I? I think the fact that weekends get too long for me and I can't wait for Monday to start so that I can go to work. If you are successful and you are happy in what you are doing, you can't wait for Monday to, to come. So I hate weekends. And due to that reason, I would say I'm successful. Because if I wasn't successful, I wouldn't look forward to going to work. And um, I have received numerous awards um, and accolations within the industry. And it wouldn't have been so if I wasn't successful in what I'm doing. So yes, I, I would consider myself successful. Gloria? Our biggest failure as a WIPOLD is that in the 23 years, we haven't been able to create a lot of WIPOLDs. So that's a big uh, blot uh, in, our, in our history. We were hoping that by now, there's more of them. And so maybe somebody like her, we didn't back them enough, we didn't push them enough uh, to be a, a withhold uh, today. But uh, I think net net, um, I think we have been successful. And success for me was uh, something like this. There must be certain sectors of South Africa where my opinion must count. It must never be that financial services can continue as if life is normal and the opinion from WIPOLD has not been heard. And I think we've gotten that right. With the agriculture sector, we're only five years uh, here we're joining a bit of a boys club. <laughs> to be honest, <coughs> I want to make sure that this sector one day will never go forward without hearing what I say. And my opinion must count because that transformation that we are talking about, we probably are best able to place it on the table in a manner which is not uh, threatening or uh, whatever. We do want the big agriculture players to remain in South Africa. We need them. We respect them. We want to learn from them. But we also want them to hear us about what maybe is this uh, transformational part that they are not doing, which is even constraining their own businesses. Uh, from growing, so that is still far from uh, on the agricultural sector. But my measure of success is that I want my opinion to be heard, generally as a person. Don't want to go to a place and nobody has heard what I think. And in business, pretty much the same. But we have failed that lot about creating uh, weapons. And, but I'm 58 now, those failures are done now. I'm not going to be doing more things, I'm old now. <laughs> uh, but the rest of the WIPOL, the institution, has got to continue with that and still attempt to create more WIPOLs and uh, because we need more of them. It doesn't seem to me that you're done yet, none of you for that matter. <laughs> Any other questions? Oh, let me back again. Thank you. Um, Gloria, my question is to you. <clears throat> Just your opinion. Do you think South Africa is ready for a woman president? If so, why? And um, if not, why not? Thank you. Did you hear I'm campaigning? Um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Yay. <laughs> 
The South Africa has always been ready for a, a woman president because on the politics, we have always had tough women who have been in politics and have sacrificed just as much uh, as their male uh, uh, colleagues. So it's not something I would say South Africa is ready now. South Africa was ready in 1994 uh, to have a woman president because they have gone through the same hardships of making it work for, for, for South Africa, whether in exile or in jail or underground. And uh, it is always going to count down to who has got the best campaign team, uh, really, because they all have uh, credentials. There's a lot of women with nice political credentials to place on the table. But I'm campaigning. Get to your campaign man are going there for you. <laughs> right, right. Do you have time for one, one more question? Thank you. All three of you are pioneering the change of women in the agriculture. Um, can you share the projects, that, exciting projects that you're currently involved in, and where we, we women can get involved as well? Thank you. Who wants to start? Yeah, I'll start. Um, I think I mentioned one or two of the, of, of the um, women leadership events that we um, host. It's, it's open to anybody in the agriculture sector, even though hosted to uh, by the uh, fresh produce industry, it's open to anybody. I think it's extremely valuable, not just the event, but what goes after it. The networks, um, the, the, the structures that we try to put in place for um, women in the business to learn from each other. Um, it's really open to anybody. O anybody can stick up their hand and get involved. And I want to urge people to get involved. If um, this platform that we host is not something that you've got access to, create one of your own. Create one in your farmer's uh, community. Um, get the women together and, and promote each other, assist each other, learn from each other. Uh, and can they get involved with your project, yes? Anybody Absolutely. Um, agriculture. Yeah, we, you can check on our website also, pma.com, and then there's a Fresh Connection Southern Africa where um, this will be hosted, or you can go directly to Centre for Growing Talent by pma.org. Sorry, it's very long. Um, or you can call me and, and come and talk to me, and I'll share more with you with what we do locally, and, um, yeah, we'll gladly share and involve you. <laughs> Little? Yeah, with me, it's a bit different. I'm not really involved in any community project or any uh, at the moment. I see my role a bit, as a little bit different. I lecture, and I just see that's my role in trying to give knowledge that I've acquired to younger people. And I think my, my knowledge that I can give is a bit different to your other lecturers. I've got practical experience, which is very, very important. So I see that's my contribution. You know, I'm not really involved in any formal uh, project at the moment. Gloria. Um, our, our agriculture project is at, at its uh, infancy, 2,000 hectares. And the intention is to increase those uh, hectares. Uh, and, and biggest concentration is still on the Eastern Cape. It's communal land, it's rural land. And I've said by default, that is women, uh, because they are the ones who are there. Uh, and um, the next province that we thought we would look at is KZN. Um, but we, we're still concentrating on Eastern Cape at this point. So that would be the involvement of women in that way, because we're not taking their land away. We are actually farming with them and hence the profit share, the rental income, and all those things that get to be put into, into structures. So women get involved in that sense because there is no middle man. The money goes direct to them. We kill the middle structures. There's no such a thing. Not even traditional leaders. Um, but we're still in the Eastern Cape Hill route for now. Cool. I think that's it. Thank you so much for everybody's participation and uh, enjoy the rest of your Nampo. I will.
Nation in Conversation proudly brought to you by Afgri, Monsanto, Nedbank, Senbis, Engine, Grain SA, and John Deere.